so my first sort of seeds of this research was for my personal breastfeeding in the clinical hospital centre here in Hapa, uh, where it became very apparent very quickly that the other women there were having a terrible time, anxious time, uh, about breastfeeding. They'd expected that it would be very easy, that it was natural, this is what you do. And actually they found it extremely difficult to do. And this created all sorts of questions and anxiety within the hospital. And that sparked off the whole story. Then I went um, and started after maternity leave then to explore this in much more detail. And I started to interview women in the Rijeka area, so within the city of Rijeka, who had been breastfeeding, were breastfeeding, uh, or had breastfed. So some of them hadn't breastfed for 40 years, but they were, I was still interviewing them. What came out in all of those interviews uh, was this sense of anxiety. Even for those people who said they found it easy, they had a sense of anxiety about breastfeeding, about feeding their infant uh, with the breast. And this constant reference to natural kept coming out. This is Pridotno. It's not period, it's period not, and I can't do it. They were constantly referring to this concept of nature, which again set off my nautical uh, alarms. Um, and I found it very striking that some women I spoke to had not spoken, they had breastfed one woman 40 years previously, and it was the first time she'd spoken about her breastfeeding experience, if you want to use that word, where she found it devastatingly difficult. And she wasn't the only one, other women also, who a large period in between, said that they never confessed, they were using words like this, they hadn't confessed how difficult it was to someone, how horrible they'd found it. Uh, and I found that extremely striking, that they kept this a secret. And there really was this kind of equation at work, which was that if I can't breastfeed and I don't find it easy, I'm not a natural mother. And if I'm not a natural mother, I'm a bad mother. That was the sort of construction they were working with. So I found that extremely um, surprising in a way that this was what some colleagues in um, other texts have mentioned, almost a dogma about breastfeeding that's there. So that, again, interested me. Um, I did interviews, uh, participant observation, luckily still breastfeeding myself, so that was useful, <laughs> going off with other women uh, to um, various conferences as well about breastfeeding, Moroda, the association. And also, quite a large questionnaire, I wanted to get a larger sample of persons um, than just the few I'd been speaking with. And there was this constant reference to that this was a challenge. Not everyone said it was difficult, and most of the time we're talking about mothers who were with their first infant, second infant, the story was very different, but it was that shock, this expectation that they were going to find it easy because it was natural, and then actually they didn't find it easy. And it was the constant term of natural. So that was the sort of start for all the research I did. One thing that kept coming up as well was that human milk is the best milk for infants. And when I said, okay, why do you say it's the best milk? Um, they were giving comparisons constantly with other species. This is the milk which is for the human infant. We must use this milk. This is the best milk. So already the other species were sort of lurking in the background, although we were talking about human milk um, at the time. So that uh, sparked off all the research that this project's basically based on. Um, then when I turned to the literature, um, to look more carefully, what I noticed was we have a very big division in the literature either focusing on human milk or animal milk. So you've got two corpus, two bodies of literature which are focusing on one or the other. Uh, Blafa Hardy was for me one of the rare exceptions where she looks, as I'm sure you um, know, uh, about non-human approaches and how that informs human approaches. So there was a connection there between humans and animals. But most of the time, the literature is talking about either human breastfeeding, the breastfeeding experience, com collections of texts, ethnographies of breastfeeding, and they use the word breastfeeding, which we have lots of discussion about terminology, whether chest feeding. And then on the other hand, we have animal milk production, so quite a different um, narrative surrounding it. And 
My problem with this was having a previous interest in human-animal relations that the analytical work of scholars themselves were making the division between humans and animals in milk. We had already, or we, when you look at the literature, the literature already separates humans and animals, where so much literature uh, related to the animal turn within anthropology is talking about the relation. How is this division made? How do we do this? If we start from the analytical position where we've already divided the two, then we can't trace out how that division actually occurs, how it's being made. So this was a criticism that I had towards the um, um, literature. Uh, Marion Strathern, I'll talk about her in a moment much more, um, is very, in her writing, very often talks about how anthropologists unwittingly repeat what they're observing in the field in their analytical work. So she's highly critical of that and she's a huge influence. So uh, that was one of the reasons why I was so maybe sensitive to that fact that that division had already been made. So that was all sort of um, fine. And I decided that I would, in my research, take a step back and question how in human analytical work, so I'm talking just from human perspective, how is milk actually humanized or animalized? So let's not make that analytical division from the beginning, looking at human milk or animal milk. How do we actually make these milks human milk or animal milk? So it was to take a step back analytically, treat milk from my position as an from an analytical position as a whole, and then see how it becomes either human or animal. And that's when it started. The second sort of part of the milk research was then including all the others in the research. So cows and donkeys, sheep and goats. Um, I spoke with all sorts of people related to milk production and milk. So farmers, consumers of milk, uh, people working in milk processing plants within Rijeka, some of the milk factories if you want, microbiologists, uh, pediatricians. So uh, people who were involved and also it was in the Rijeka area also in Istria the donkey milk is mainly in Istria nearby us uh, Grobnik the area just outside just outside of Rijeka and the island of Pag with its Pag cheese uh, was also an interesting very interesting area for looking at sheep milk production so I wanted to bring everyone in if you like to the picture and what I found was that each milk has its own very specific, I don't want to use the fla word flavour because it's a bit play on words, but it really is in the sense that each milk has its own narrative, its own interest. Certain things are foregrounded in the narratives that people are talking about. Um, cow's milk was very much related to commercial production, making cheese, um, industrial, different from commercial, the industrial taste of the milk, uh, using industrial food, uh, for the cows and European Union laws which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, sheep on the island of Pag, very interesting uh, discussions about uh, whether the sheep are part of the matichni stado or opce stado, whether the milk is value, val more valuable if it's from which herd, introduction of Israeli sheep in the 1920s to prevent inbreeding. Um, and one thing that I found particularly interesting, perhaps for those of you interested in spatial research and spatial relations, was that around the small town of, or village town of Kolan on the island of Pag, the land was actually divided up according to the number of members of the family. So the stone walls are almost representative of the size of the family, um, because if there was a large piece of land, that meant it was a larger family. So there's all sorts of interesting things when you can take, you can see the stone walls and then imagine, or not imagine, but actually representing families in some way. Um, donkey milk had its own, again, um, very often talked about in terms of health benefits, raising your immune system, helping people with lung disease. Uh, I presume magarache kashal is, uh, yeah. Uh, so, and also it's, um, in substance, if we use that word, is proximity to human milk, how this is uh, very um, uh, good for 
uh, humans because it's so close to human milk. So there was that relation going on there. Uh, goat's milk, um, lots of stories about uh, goats being banned in the 1950s, about goats, uh, uh, not people not being able to keep goats uh, on the Grobnik area, about goats being cows of the poor, and this interesting way how goats were kept for people and the cow's milk was either sold or, as uh, quite a few said, kept for the doctor uh, when the doctor came as a gift to them. So, again, its own sort of narrative you could find in the, in the goat's milk. The, um, human milk in all of this focused mainly on infant health, the benefits of human milk for human infants, and the relation between the mother and the infant, good mother, bad mother, this um, discussion. So when you um, put all the milks together uh, via species, you do see really quite sort of um, unique stories in a way for each species, which are also obviously connectable. We'll, I'll mention this in a moment. Then there's the stories around the milk, uh, milkmaids, uh, the ladies carrying the milk in from the Grobnik area. Uh, this is one lady I interviewed and she was showing how she carries her uh, basket or how she used to carry her basket. Uh, very interesting uh, narratives around the milkmaids. This constant talk of sacrifice, how they sacrifice for their families. Uh, what I found very interesting was that um, there are some local festivals in the summer celebrating milkmaids and statues of milkmaids in the landscape. There are three or four in the Rijeka area, one right in the centre on Milkmaid Square. Um, and what I couldn't help always, well can't help always noting is that they're still carrying their burden, they're still carrying something, they're driven about to these different festivals to open the festival, they're still very, very active. Um, and all the time this talk about how they're sacrificed for their families, as mothers making a sacrifice in these narratives about them, they're a sort of representation, a symbol of the better past and what they need to instill into the younger generations. What is also notable about them um, and the narratives surrounding milkmaids is that there are things that are left out, which actually you can only hear from the milkmaids themselves. One very extreme problem with doing research with milkmaids is that they are all in their late 80s, 90s, so this is a um, problem in terms of interviews and, and, and capturing the material, capturing their stories, um, because there's now only a very few who are still alive. And they talk about smuggling sugar over the borders um, there and smuggling things, but that's kept out of the other narratives that people talk about. They're very pure uh, people who are sacrificing and the smuggling of coffee and sugar and things and their dresses, or how they used to be terrified in the dark uh, from the village drunks who would be still staggering home and they would already be setting off. All of that's kind of, it's, it's not audible. So again, enormous amount of material um, we can find when we look at milkmaids. Um, what I concluded is this, and this is very much again relying on Marion Strathern and her ideas of social relations being the engines of social life, uh, that milk we should consider as a relation. We should see all the different relations that are surrounding milk and it's actually the product of a relation. So whether we start with mammal and infant, um, we've got all the other relations involved, human and paediatrician, all of these relations are involved in these milk relations. Um, very interesting with humans talking about how they uh, were terrified to confess to the paediatrician they'd stop best feeding. So again, a confessional thing. So all sorts of different things we can see, microbiologists and microbe, microbes and vegetation, also something that uh, greatly captured my attention. Um, and then what we can see is that within these milk relations there are actually quite strict social norms. When I was writing this I kept dithering between the word taboo and social norm because taboo seems such a anthropologist, such a strong word. So I put social norms, but adults drinking human milk, uh, it's all right for infants to drink human milk, but when you suggest to adults about adults drinking human milk, we've crossed the, we've crossed the boundary, something's going on there. Uh, kinship relations, I spoke to the Effendi and the Jamia and Yika, 
um, about Islamic kinship, milk kinship, I don't know how much, um, about how if uh, two infants share the breast of the same woman, they're actually classified as kid, their siblings, so they can't then marry because they're siblings. So that's interesting. And he was explaining how it's all right to have the milk in your mouth, but if it's digested, it's when it gets to the stomach that the troubles uh, in terms of taboo relation, in terms of marriage. So this is very interesting. There's all sorts of interesting things going on there. Um, regulations about how milk is produced, I'll talk about that in a bit more in a second. Also very important, preparations that are made for the milk relation. So whether we're talking about a human milk relation or an animal milk relation, there are lots of preparations made for this relation. Time frames for milk relations, also the length of the relation. Um, we have, especially in human, um, perhaps because it's more visible to us in our everyday movements, um, quite a strict, again, social norm in the sense that it's wonderful when the mother is breastfeeding the infant, but when the infant gets to, and it did seem to me almost you could measure it, about a year and a half, two years old, then there was a tip, and it was no, a tipping point. And it was no longer a good relation, it had slipped into a gentle perversion. And children who were breastfeeding at the age of four had slipped into very wrong area, according to the narratives that I heard. So actually the relations have a quite strict temporal form to them. Um, and again, I'll talk that about that in a moment. And something that where I teach the course Cultural Geography, um, and adore looking at this spatial relations, but the actual spatial relations of milk are also extremely interesting. Where do these milk relations actually unfold? Um, right at the very beginning I showed a picture, this is, a, I'll show in a I can quickly go back, um, of, this is one of the paths of the milkmaids, uh, and they are dotted around Rijeka, and now they're being reconstructed for tourism and um, all sorts of uh, different activities, so they have some festivals on this part here to celebrate milkmaids. So there's all sorts of um, um, different spatial relations, and again benches, and I see that in Belgrade the same about the breastfeeding benches uh, that, uh, in Zagreb as well. And actually at one parent conference a very big debate about breastfeeding benches that were made for women to breastfeed and people saying this is a form of segregation in the sense that why should they breastfeed on a special breastfeeding bench? Why can't they just breastfeed on the bench? So any bench, so discussions there. So looking at my question of how do humans transform milk into human milk or animal milk, um, it became more than clear through this research that there are myriad different social practices that need to be mapped out if we want to look at that process. So that was um, kind of all settled and fine. Uh, one area um, that I found particularly interesting um, is about food hygiene laws. That was something with farmers very often came up was about working on the black in the grey economy that after the implementation of food hygiene laws by European Union uh, it was uh, very difficult to work legally because of all the requirements that the laws have in terms of stainless steel. Everything has to be stainless steel, especially the cheese production, the processing of milk, or the architecture of the building, that you have certain entrances and exits and you're not allowed to cross raw milk with milk product um, on the path mustn't cross. So uh, this was a great interest to me uh, with the previous interest in microbes. Um, that with the human milk, uh, because it was this narrative of naturalness, there wasn't this sense of danger. There were no EU regulations on breastfeeding and the milk uh, production. Um, sometimes I would be quite having conversations with the microbiologist, I look at Edward, <laughs> um, I was quite uh, surprised at how relaxed some mothers seem to be about microbes in human milk. So this was interesting. Whereas animal milk was seen as something extremely dangerous and highly regulated. Now, of course we can interpret, well, humans are not producing milk on a mass scale and we've got all of those issues, so this is more regulated. Uh, women are not selling their milk, although some are. Um, so, but what we could see is that the law is just focusing on animal milk. 
And then we've got these terms that kept popping up with food hygiene, with domachi milk, uh, domachi, which is a concept which I think we <laughs> really need to explore. Uh, industrial uh, milk production, unhealthy, healthy. And this I found interesting because of, and I hope that this might be, I'm trying to capture for your interest, um, something that um, is visible in the literature uh, about food hygiene laws in the zone, uh, in the post-socialist context, that's the title they give, not me, but that's the title they're using. Um, Elizabeth Dunn and others um, have written about food hygiene laws, European Union food hygiene laws, and how that's affecting everyday relations. Um, Dunn says that these laws are in effect highlighting zones of wildness which they then need to eradicate. So they're showing the wildness in order to then control it. And her argument, she's most vocal, but others as well, um, Astara, Minsight, Jung, talk about these um, um, laws or regulations about being a form of Trojan horse for the EU neoliberal project. That's the phrase they use. Um, in the sense that it's through these food hygiene laws that the small-scale producers are actually cleared away and then the large corporations can come in and take over the market, so whether it's meat or milk. Um, and one of the reasons that they say they need to do this according to the European Union food hygiene laws is because the people in these zones of wildness are not aware of the danger of microbes. So in effect they're pre-pasturian, they don't have the um, knowledge about bacteria um, and that's why the laws must come and clean it up. Um, I don't want to talk too much of be like some wild British Brexit person at the moment because uh, that's really not my interest but um, there is something there which is very interesting in that the farmers I spoke to in the Grobnik area and other areas were extremely um, uh, critical of these laws because of the fact that they were no longer allowed to work legally. They wanted to work legally. They didn't actually want to cheat the system. They were wanting to work legally, but the laws had in effect priced them out of their work. So that was something sort of a side interest that I found very interesting in this research. And also the fact that the focus is on non-human milk and not on human. So that seemed uh, during the research and the reading after research and during research seemed to all sort of nicely fit and everything was um, in its place until obviously <laughs> the writing process starts <laughs> and then it doesn't fit anymore. And so now I want to talk about some of the issues actually that with hindsight, the benefit of hindsight, this research question, how do we transform or how do we as humans transform milk into human milk and animal milk is actually limited. We need to go a step beyond that. It's a limited question. Um, so when organizing the ethnographic material, and here we can visualize books, um, first the idea was to divide each chapter by species, human, goat, because of these separate narratives that seemed a nice way to organize the material. And then it seemed that this didn't seem right. So then, again, I thought, well, maybe we can do it by form to milk relations, the actual different things involved in the milk relations. So we can focus on time, we can focus on the legal relations or lack of legal relations, spatial relations, geographies of milk, um, and look in that sense. Look at the different ways that relations are uh, cut, how they're prepared for, we can explore it like that. But. What became, again, with Marilyn Strathern, and I'll talk about her now in more depth, was that in all of these accounts, in both forms, uh, species is the point of reference. The division is made with species. Um, and in fact, I was doing the same thing that I was criticizing the others of doing, which was they had got to the human-animal division, and I just made the tidy in between species division but was using the same, if you like, the same form. And here's where I'll lean on Marilyn Strathern. I don't know how much you are acquainted with Marilyn Strathern. She's a influence. Um, and she um, 
uh, uh, has written a number of very influential texts. Uh, the gender of the gift, uh, comparison between Melanesian from Papua New Guinea gender relations and Euro-American gender relations. So she has made um, a comparison where the value, at least I see, of her work is that she takes um, the ethnographic, the analytical work of the people she is doing her research with, not on, but with, uh, takes their analytical constructions and then compares it to anthropological constructions. Uh, within the anthropological project, that's actually quite revolutionary in the sense that we've got our obviously colonial background that we have to accept is there. Um, and this, in the sense, is uh, not giving the anthropologists the analytical um, control, but in fact we're borrowing, or not borrowing, but um, through our ethnographic work, trying to construct the analytical work which we can then compare with ours. So it's a very equalising, I would say, analytical position, which is the value I see definitely in her work. Um, in one of her texts, Partial Connections, which she wrote in the beginning of the 90s, well, published in the 90s, she borrows um, the Cantor's dust um, and talks about the fact that when we do our analytical work within anthropology, depending on the analytical scale we take, information is gained or lost. So we can take a very distant scale if we're looking at, um, for example, a state from one perspective, or we can take a small scale and look at individual relations. But what she says is, and this is for her what I would say is how she defines culture, is that the reference points are the same. So we're actually at different scales repeating the same analytical construction. And that for me was what was echoing in my head when I was thinking about this division between species, is in fact that like the uh, division from the larger scale of human animal milk, one division, and then I was doing exactly the same thing. So whilst it was perhaps ethically viable and slightly provocative, it seemed at the beginning, to put humans in amongst animals at the same analytical, if you like, level, if you want to use that word. Actually, analytically, I wasn't doing anything novel, uh, which for me, um, I could hear her voice saying, as I said, same old, same old. <laughs> so um, what it seemed to me was that there's an assumption between the relation between species and milk, which needs to be thought about. And that's where we come into this very tricky area of the relation between milk and animal body. Um, we assume that milk produced by a cow is cow's milk, uh, milk produced by donkey is donkey milk and so on. So we make an assumption there about the relation. Um, and anthropological work and in other areas this has been problematized. So if we start just looking from the anthropological perspective, um, there's been a vast body of literature criticizing uh, this idea of blood holding people together, that this is the actual holding. David Schneider, critic of the study of kinship, nearly destroyed the field of kinship for anthropologists by saying, well, it's all blood, uh, so <laughs> what are we doing? Um, and then this started a interest in other ways of creating kin relations, uh, Kath Weston with uh, uh, gay relations with time, Janet Carsten with the idea of shared eating in uh, South Asia, how uh, people are eating together and that's the way of um, uh, forgetting past relations and creating new relations. And I put paper with a question mark because um, my PhD was actually on ethnicity <laughs> and I was also looking since very often voiced in terms of blood relations, what blood are we, and that's how we determine our ethnicity. And what I discovered and was one of the main arguments of my PhD was actually, no, it's paper, it's documents, it's the bureaucracy, it's the, the pichat, the stamp. That's what actually creates the relation. That's what's confirming the uh, relation. So we can talk and have a lovely narrative about the blood relations but it's not until we've got the paper with the stamp on it that proves that relation. And so for me, actually paper um, is the relation, the document. Um, and so that disembodies, and there's this area within anthropology about this, this trying to avoid using the body as the way of, or bodily relations or embodied relations as the way of connecting persons. And that for me, um, when we start to think about cow's milk and cow 
does it have to come from the body of a cow, it unsettles slightly. So that was the sort of first step in thinking about this. The second step was um, buying from STS literature, uh, where there's crossover with anthropologists, Anne-Marie Moll and others. Um, this idea of Lauren Lien's discussion about what is a salmon. Uh, they did field work in Norway, fishing, um, fish farm. And they said that what they observe is that there are two approaches to this question. The first is the empirical epistemological approach, what they call, um, is that we can have lots of different salmon narratives, but actually there's an underlying salmon. There's an original salmon. Uh, it's a reality which is beyond human control. So salmon is something out there, and we can have our different narratives, but there's the underlying proto-salmon. Um, the other approach, they say, is the empirical ontological approach, where they say there's no underlying salmon, but different salmons are products of different salmon relations, so multiple salmons, and there's no underlying proto-salmon. So that started to get me to think about cows, is there a proto-cow? And then, very much within anthropology, uh, we've had what's called the animal turn, where everyone's become interested in animal, human-animal relations. And again, I don't know if you've come across Eduardo Viveros de Castro, a Brazilian anthropologist, uh, with his ideas of perspectivism, where he, through a very delicate and wonderful tracing of uh, Amazonian mythology, uh, draws out how that within this ontology, what he calls a Mary Indian ontology, the original common condition, unlike our Euro-American tradition, is humanity and not animality. So rather than us all starting from bacteria and having shared animality in some shape, which we can come back, we can behave like animals if we don't control ourselves, it's always lurking within. Um, in this social um, context, actually, it's humanity, which is the underlying, is the starting point. Um, and then from there, we are all, in fact, sharing same but different social worlds in the sense that we are all experiencing the world in the same way, whether we're human or animal, but because of our different bodies, we're experiencing it differently as well. And this is this idea of multi-nature rather than mono-nature of the Euro-American perspective. Um, Anthropologists, we always get very bogged down with our regional comparisons, uh, which is a fault and a strength, I would say, at the same time. Uh, and Philippe Descola um, has his, uh, he was Levi Strauss's student, so we can see the nice division. <laughs> um, but he talks very much about animism, which he says is the Amazonian approach, the multi nature, where um, humans and animals in the relation, we have dissimilar physicalities, but we have similar interiorities. Um, the naturalist approach, which is the Euro-American approach, is that we have dissimilar interiorities, but similar physicalities. So there's a neat division, which obviously is source of much criticism and discussion. So naturalism, according to this, is then the Euro-American approach. Um, the difference between us, we have a material similarity with other non-humans, but our difference is in our interior worlds, whereas animism, it's the other way around. So, some anthropologists have asked, well, can we really say that about the Euro-American cultural context? It's really important, Marilyn Strathern uses this comparative device between uh, Melanesians and Euro-Americans, uh, Viveros de Castro, um, Philip de Scola also, and they all say, we're not doing this to really say that everyone in Euro-American context is doing this. We're using this as a device to try to think about things. And that uh, is obviously, absolutely we can take that, but there is a slippage within anthropology constantly where it's then associated to that particular ethnographic region. Um, and André Zuppi did field work in France and said, well, this naturalist approach is just not, I don't see it with, she was doing it with um, farmers, I don't see it. And Yates, Dor and Moll, Anne-Marie Moll, who wrote The Body Multiple, um, also say that 
This is a form of window dressing, this naturalist approach, and actually we shouldn't uh, believe it, we shouldn't um, uh, accept it as it is, we should uh, see that this is all part of the Euro-American, if you like, uh, way of uh, doing relations, of doing relations. So there is some disturbance there when we start to think about the relation between cows and milk, so going back to milk now. Can we say that there is a mono-cow, a proto-cow, an underlying cow, which then informs all other cows? And one thing I heard again from older generations, you expect, I'm sure, that no, the milk we drink today, this isn't from a cow. These cows are not cows. This is not cow's milk. Uh, that's a very different milk from the milk that we have. And these aren't proper cows. These cows are modified cows. So. Temporarily, no. There is well, perhaps we could say, well, they're referring to a mono cow, proto cow being in the past. We've got very serious breeding programs, spatial relations, cows who are living in a byre, cows that are living on pastures are not the same cows. So when we talk about cow's milk, whose milk are we actually referring to? Um, and then the different type of cow, whether it's domachi, is this a cow for the, just the farm or is it industrial cow? So, Suddenly, the species stability seems problematic, at least I think so. Um, and then, if we take a step uh, beyond just the Rijeka and Grobnik region, we can start to see, um, I don't know, perhaps you've seen this or heard of this uh, declaration by the Court of Justice of the European Union, there was a discussion about milk. Is milk, uh, uh, it was a question that was asked, um, one um, association in Germany took this company Tofu Town to court uh, because they said that Tofu Town were advertising their um, plant milk made from plants as cheese and cream and that this was unfair competition and that uh, this needs to be ruled upon. So it, got, it went up the different levels to the Court of Justice who were then asked this question, the queue is here, I wrote it out in full because um, they ask, is it exclusively the normal mammary secretion? So we're defining milk. Um, and can we refer to soy milk as being uh, milk? The answer, the ruling was that no, milk uh, can't be, plant milk can't be milk. It has to come from a mammary secretion. Um, and as well, that for me, which is fascinating, is that if it's not stated, um, if it's not bovine, it has to be stated. So the proto milk, in this sense, is cow's milk, and then the other milks are have to be stated. Um, two things about this example, which really stood out to me in thinking about the relation between cow and milk. The first is that Tofu Town said, in defence, well, our um, Things have changed so much that people understand we can use this. We're not cheating the customer because things have changed so much that they understand when we mean this, that we're not meaning cow's milk. That was their argument. But for me, the absolutely uh, most fascinating thing is that we are discussing what is milk here in the court, <laughs> the document again. Yes, <laughs> we've got to decide it's not fixed. So that relation between cow and milk, it's, it, we have to fix it and we're debating in court cases. And then when we go back to the regulation on confirming the contents of raw milk, which is a recent one uh, in Croatia, um, we have these definitions of what is the milk. So cow's milk has to fulfill these parameters in the lab, uh, sheep's milk and goat's milk. So actually, um, that for me answered my question about species stability in the sense that uh, yes, the milk can come from a cow, but if it doesn't fulfill these parameters, it's actually, officially, not cow's milk. Uh, and that's an interesting thing because, again, not trying to be the wild Brexiteer, because I'm not, but it's just with these thoughts. <laughs> um, we, this is, again, with European Union alignment, and it's rationalising the cows these definitions. So this is for milk that's being sold legally. The illegal sales of milk on the Grobnik plain, which are happening all the time, they don't have to define the milk in this way. It's if you want to sell it legally under these regulations. So it's really, I would say, getting into really everyday relations. 
So absolutely that species stability question needs to be thought about more. And this is where kind of drawing now coming to the end of what I wanted to say to you today was um, this with the Grobnitschki sea, so cheese from Grobnik. It's a very salty cheese um, and it's supposed to, according to all the people I spoke to, come from sheep. It's a sheep cheese, it's not a cow cheese. And this, most of the cheese that's being sold is being sold, I, it's very difficult to say illegally because that's making a judgment, but it's being sold under the table. And when I was speaking with farmers, one Pamela in particular said that he found it extremely difficult because other farmers were mixing their Grobnitschki seer with cow's milk and selling it for cheaper price. And the customers were coming to him and complaining about the cost of his cheese because it was more expensive. And he said, but it's more expensive because my cheese is sheep cheese and they're making cow's cheese and sheep cheese. So of course it's cheaper because cow's milk is cheaper. They're being cheated by the farmer. That was his argument to me. And that for a long time seemed absolutely the case. Yes, the farmer is cheating the customers who are eating the cheese. And they are being hoodwinked into believing that this cheese is sheep cheese when in fact it's mixed with cow's cheese. And then I read this article by Yates Dorr about meat in Highland Guatemala. Uh, she did field work with a family, this, her host Dulce Maria. Uh, they went to the market and she has an article where she explains this in great detail how they went to the market and Dulce Maria said it's a national holiday, we're going to eat more meat today or oh, in these days we're going to eat more meat. So they went to the butcher and she has in her article photographs of the butcher with the meat hanging, the sausages and all the other things. And she said that uh, Dulce Maria spoke with the butcher how she was going to prepare the food and everything. And then she bought the meat and the eight store saw oh, sorry, uh, a sign saying um, soy. So in fact at the butcher, in the butcher shop, they were buying meat but it said uh, soy, soy. And then Dolce Maria the next day cooked this and the family ate the big meal and they also said this is great. And basically what a lovely meat that was. And again, uh, Yates Dor was uh, discussing the same what I had been thinking with the farmer about how Dulce Maria had hoodwinked her family into thinking they were eating meat by preparing it and saying that it was meat, when in fact it wasn't meat. And then she said, which struck me very much with the idea of the cheese, is exactly that in fact all, everyone, the people producing or Dulce Maria and her family were engaged in this um, co-conspiracy in some way, where everyone was accepting that this was meat. They, and they did this by suspending the knowledge of essence. That wasn't the important thing, which is why, so forgive me that I put out her quote in full because I find it so useful, um, is that um, she's saying it's not the point that species don't exist, it's rather they do not exist outside the practices through which they come into being. So they were enacting meat, and so this was meat. So then I went back to my cheese people in Grubnik, started to think about this, and realized that the customers were probably somewhere aware uh, that this was cow's milk, which was why it was cheaper. But they were also enacting sheep uh, cheese, and everyone was kind of satisfied with that conclusion. So that for me uh, is interesting because, again, it's a, and this is what Marion Strathern would say, a very analytical, sleight of hand in the sense that I've made a very small assumption which has actually pushed the whole narrative, the whole analysis in the wrong direction because I had actually turned these consumers into passive cheatable vessels where in fact I didn't know, I can't tell from my material because I had assumed that but I hadn't actually spoken with the consumers. Um, so that, that um, is a way in which that species stability for me is, is made through the analytical work rather than the actual ethnographic material, which is what Marion Strathern is constantly saying. Ethnography, <laughs> the ethnographic material, stop imposing your little bits <laughs> onto, go and, of course, methodology, how do we get to that material? But it's so important to really stick to that material, like follow it, all its contours, 
because that's how we're doing it. So just to go full circle, if you like, back um, to the women at the beginning, I mentioned the mothers about uh, their concerns with breastfeeding. Um, now, after a lot of thinking, I hope, and reading, um, it's not just a question about how do we humans uh, animalize and humanize milk, but it's also how milk is making species and how it's making cows and sheep and humans and donkeys and goats. And when we go back, or when I go back to the mother's anxiety, they are anxious because the milk, the absence of milk for their infant, is making the wrong kind of infant. Infants who drink human milk, according to a lot of the discourses, are more intelligent. They won't have problems with allergies, all these things. So you can suddenly understand why these mothers are in such fear, because it's not a relation which is lasting for six months, one year, two years. It's a relation that's actually going to affect that person until the end of their life. So it's an enormous pressure. On the other hand, when we start to think about um, milk and how it makes non-humans, um, we have instances of cows in New Zealand who are producing by themselves, rather than genetic modification, skimmed milk. And now we are trying to uh, take the genes of those skimmed milk cows to produce a herd of skimmed milk. And that is again very important when we start thinking about breeding programs, about sperm donation, all the technologies that are invested or involved into making cows. Um, and that's basically where I've got to. So um, with the anthropologist talking about the Anthropocene and Anad Singh, I, again, I don't know if you're with her work about mushrooms, a uh, lot of work about mushrooms, very interesting. Um, but as she says, we need to understand the dynamics through which these plants and animals are abstracted in order to become resources. She says that's a very pressing problem. And for me, how we make a species through milk is one of the abstractions. But we need to follow it. We need to follow it ethnographically rather than making our assumptions. Um, and this is, I think, where I would like to end. So, okay, thank you.